Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. There is Euroscepticism beyond Brexit. We've got that story, plus a little bit of good news about the late, great Muhammad Ali. But first, James, it's a question you asked actually on one of your latest videos. What's on the agenda for Bilderberg 2016? Of course, the Bilderberg meeting where all the big moving and grooving elites get together. And we've talked about the Bilderberg for quite some time in the alternative media. And we always sort of note, James, that if this were a bunch of football players or a bunch of music producers who wanted to squirrel away and hide away, you'd have journalists breaking down the walls. But when it's the biggest financiers and banksters in the world, there's nary a peep. So as the years have gone by, Bilderberg has actually gotten more open about what they do, at least sort of issuing their own press releases. And we'll take it from right from the mouth of the beast, James. The 64th Bilderberg meeting set to take place from June 9th to the 12th, 2016 in Dresden, Germany. A total of around 130 participants from 20 countries have confirmed their attendance. As ever, a diverse group of political leaders and experts from industry, finance, academia, and the media have been invited. Of course, the list of full Full participants is available on BilderbergMeetings.org, and they have their top 10 key topics for discussion this year, James, and they include current events, China, Europe, Middle East, Russia, U.S. political landscape and economy, cybersecurity, geopolitics of energy and commodity prices, precariat in the middle class, and technological innovation. Now, James, as I was putting together some of the show notes for this episode, as you and I just briefly discussed off mic, I went down that list and immediately said, what the hell is precariat? And so I went and searched, and it's literally a portmanteau of precarious proletariat, the growing underclass of precariats with insecure jobs and no future in an age of artificial intelligence. So our activist post has a new article getting into just this point of the list, James. And it's it's a pretty generic kind of vague list of current events. Russia, those are a little further reaching than that. So I want to hear your analysis on these kind of 10 points, James, as Bilderberg 2016 kicks off. Well, you just did exactly what I just did going through that list, which is exactly what Ernie Hancock did when I read that list to him yesterday on Declare Your Independence, which is exactly what QZ.com and everyone else is doing. They're all saying, what the hell is precariat? And it strikes me as fascinating that Bilderberg has gone from the meeting that cannot be named, you cannot even discuss it, you cannot talk about it, cannot even be broached, to a meeting that now has, as you say, its own official website, and it is at least mentioned in the mainstream media, if only to mock the crazy conspiracy theorists that want to know what these guys are up to. Oh, you crazy kooks out there. Um, and as part of that transition, I think they are now using their agenda, their, the public agenda, as a PR propaganda vehicle for the, the next wave of propaganda they want to roll out. I think precariat is a word they are seeding into the public consciousness right now because, precisely because, it's interesting. What does that mean? I've never heard that before. Everyone goes to look it up. As I say, it's on QZ.com and other mainstream sites are now reporting on precariat because the Bilderberg are talking about it. So I, I think this is turning into a Davos-like thing where they're using their agenda as part of the rollout of the agenda. And you remember back earlier this year at Davos when we covered that, they were talking about the rise of the robots and, you know, the, the death of the working class. Well, now at Bilderberg, they're talking about the, the problems of the working class, the precarious proletariat. Interesting. But here's another interesting part of this. They're framing this, of course, in the situation, th this is a problem. This is an economic problem that obviously they're going to have to solve, the, the technocrats who rule over us, because, oh, everyone needs that lifelong employment with the same corporation that gives the health benefits and everything. But think, what is the precariat? It is, at least potentially, the agoristic class. It is people working around the system. It's people working under the table. It's people working through peer-to-peer -peer economy. That actually is potentially a wonderful thing, a freeing thing, a good thing. It can be, of course, a very bad thing for people in the situation that are, you know, that, that feel that they have no out for it. But if people understand this to be part of agorism and getting around the system, then yes, I see why it's a problem for the Bilderbergers, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem.
problem that we need them to solve. So I think this is part of a PR campaign that they're rolling out right now to try to convince us that we need to do something. Oh, the governments are going to have to step in and help these workers, you know, who are being displaced by the rise of the robots they were talking about at Davos. And it's just fascinating to me how basically Bilderberg is now being used as a propaganda vehicle. It's their own revelation of the method in some ways. They worked really, really hard to keep it all secret, and then once it inevitably pops, they sort of go, well, we'll work really, really hard to make it very public, and we'll have everybody actually talking about and parroting their own talking points. James, I was looking at some of the updates, and over the last couple of hours, Dan Dix, Luke Rakowski, and Jeff Berwick were all detained and threatened at Bilderberg 2016. You can see it actually on all of their socials of being detained by German cops. And that kind of brings up the question that, again, I, I, I wonder about in this situation. Now, if have we broken Bilderberg, so to speak? And is the, at this point any really good intel coming out? Is this a point, James, where, again, oh, the machine loves for you to rage against it. It gives it legitimacy. I think that's part of what's going on here. And uh, I hope there's some good intel that comes out of this conference, but I haven't seen good actionable intel coming out of there for years now. I've just seen basically a focus and a fixation on Bilderberg as, as Bilderberg rather than on what they're actually talking about. And I don't know if anyone has the sources that Jim Tucker used to have, for example. There you go. And that's, I mean, those kind of, those kind of leaks and breakthroughs are now several years in the past. James, we also have the Bohemian Grove coming up in just a few weeks as well. So there'll be another sort of summer get together for the powers that shouldn't be. And speaking of the powers that shouldn't be, we move to beyond Brexit. So, James, on June 23rd, people in the United Kingdom will vote on a referendum on whether to remain in the European Union or to leave the Brussels based institution, a decision that has come to be called Brexit, British exit from the European Union. The British go to the polls at a time when new multi nation surveys from the Pew Research Center finds that Euro skepticism, there's another smashed together portmanteau for you, is on the rise across Europe, and that about two thirds of both the British and the Greeks, along with significant minorities and other key nations, want some powers returned from Brussels to national governments. So again, James, this is actually coming from Pew Research. Whether favorable or not toward Brussels, most Europeans agree that a British exit would harm the 28-member EU. So for a bit of an analysis on this, you tweeted a piece from Alternative Economics or Alternate Economics, who drills into a lot of this data. And Pew Research, it's got charts and graphs and all sorts of things, and you can scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. But this analysis points out a couple of interesting things. This Pew Research Center study on Euroscepticism beyond Brexit shows a huge dip in EU favorability across the board. France has an even lower overall favorable rating of the EU than the UK. The favorable score is 38% in France, 44% in the UK. So, James, this vote is coming up in just a few weeks. And I actually reported recently on my own Morning Monarchy show that that's exactly when the largest concert festival kicks off in the UK, Glastonbury. And so there's worries that all kinds of kids are going to be out rocking in the mud and not voting in the Brexit. James. Very interesting. I suppose that wouldn't or shouldn't be surprising. Hey, let's schedule this for the start of Glastonbury and make sure all those pesky kids are out of the equation. Actually, the interesting, to me, the most interesting part of these numbers uh, that uh, they break down in Pew Research there is that the younger people in all of these nations are more predisposed towards being favorable to Europe. It's the older people that are raging against Europe, which I guess makes sense in some ways, but um, but that's that's not a good sign in terms of the overall you know where this is going because obviously it's the it's the youngins that are set the political agenda for tomorrow, and it, yeah, it seems the youngins have been indoctrinated since they were little schoolchildren to love the EU. So uh, unfortunately, maybe long term, it doesn't even matter if Brexit goes ahead or not, I don't imagine it's going to. I would wish that the UK would declare its independence, but uh, I don't think the voting machines are going to allow them to. But even if they did, it looks like in the long term, the youth have already been indoctrinated and brainwashed into 
loving the EU, which is quite a feat because remember 10 years ago, uh, back in 2007, they had the 50th anniversary of the EU. They said, oh, you remember that Treaty of Rome that we signed back in 57 that we told you was just a little treaty, you know, just a trade treaty? Well, actually, that was the start of the EU. Ha <laughs> ha, fooled you suckers. And now it's the 50th birthday. Yeah, let's have birthday celebrations across Europe. And in every major city, they had 50th anniversary celebrations and the streets were empty. <laughs> no one came to them because no one cares. Most Europeans don't fundamentally feel European and saluting the EU flag, uh, that's a bunch of propaganda tripe and malarkey. And unfortunately, it may be working on the younger generation who've been steeped in it their whole life, but the older generation know this is all nonsense. And, uh, it, you know, it's a question of um, whether they're able to to basically sn to, to tie that noose and cinch that net, uh, net even tighter. But as I say, I'm not hopeful for that Brexit's going to happen, if for no other reason than we've seen the EU voted down in the past. We've seen their constitution rejected, so they came back with the Lisbon Treaty. We saw Ireland reject the Lisbon Treaty. They made them vote again until they got it right. So, you know, what's, what's the odds that Britain's actually going to exit? Unfortunately, it's not looking good. Well, and they tie in, I think if you look for any coverage here in the States on this story, the only recent coverage tie in is, oh, Donald Trump may actually take a trip over there as the Brexit vote is happening. So speaking of presidential selections, James, our third and final story takes us this week to Rand Paul as he honors Muhammad Ali by introducing a bill to end selective service. This past Monday, U.S. Senator Rand Paul announced that he'll be filing legislation designed to end the requirement for registration for selective service. Senator Paul, a Republican from Kentucky, said he would introduce a bill titled the Muhammad Ali Voluntary Service Act in honor of the recently deceased boxer who famously refused to be drafted into military service for the Vietnam War. Quote, we have an all-volunteer military. Right now, there's selective service registration in case they want to have a draft. I don't think there's a reason to have a draft, Paul said in Louisville, Kentucky on Monday. I agree with Muhammad Ali. If a war is worth fighting for, people will volunteer. It's the quote that I'm mangling there. So, James, actually, back in April of 67, Ali would be stripped of his heavyweight championship and convicted of draft evasion. The Supreme Court would actually overturn that conviction later. Muhammad Ali passed away on June 3rd, 2016, at the age of 74. Now, ironically, Rand Paul's call to end selective service comes at a time when some lawmakers are seeking to expand the criteria for registration for selective service to include women. So, James, here in America, we, you know, we don't have the draft, as we just noticed, but you'll get arrested if you don't sign up for the not a draft selective service list when you turn 18. And I remember being 18 and remember, again, a little younger sometimes and you can kind of see through the BS of things. But maybe as you were noting earlier, you're a little younger and can't fully see through the BS of life. It takes you a little later or you grow up. But as I now can look back on that, oh, there is still a draft. It's just if you decide you want to have one. James. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it, that's one of the things that I guess is good about being Canadian. I know a lot of countries have this either something like that or an actual draft or whatever military service or civilian service of some sort. We didn't, so I never had to go through that rigmarole. I wonder if I was 18 and had to do that on penalty of, you know, being jailed. You know, if I would have just went along with it, I guess I probably would have. I'm assuming most people just just do. It's just something you do, and they're not going to have a draft. Um, it is ridiculous. It is. Uh, I mean, this is the government claiming ownership of you. We own you, and when and if we want you to serve in the military, you will do so, uh, or we will throw you in prison. I mean, that is ownership. They claim they own you. That is the most disgusting thing that is imaginable on this planet, and the vast majority of people won't even think twice about it, won't even bat an eyelid. And I think the pull quote there, the key quote, imagine a voluntary, a truly voluntary military where people have to actually want to be part of it and to be convinced that there is a reason to be part of it. How many of the wars in the past do you think would have had that kind of popular participation? And some of them certainly would have because they always do a false flag and you know propaganda to try to get the public on board. But uh, now that we're dismantling that here online and people are waking up to that agenda, they're going to have to pull that draft uh, switch at some point, especially if they want to go to a hot war with uh, China or Russia or Iran or whatever combination thereof. So, uh, yeah, uh, abolish it. Get rid of the damn selective service. That's, I mean, that's a start. 
and uh, stop believing that the government has ownership over you. I think you're, you're getting at the musical question asked by a punk band called TSOL. Suppose they gave a war and no one comes. James, a little bit of other good news about Muhammad Ali. So this is an interesting one. On March 8th, 1971, as 300 million people gathered to watch Muhammad Ali's first major fight since he was convicted in 1967 for bravely refusing to fight in the unjust Vietnam War, a group of heroic anti-war activists plotted their burglary of the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania. The noise from the fight would provide cover to the burglars as they broke into the office to expose the FBI's heinous crimes. The group of eight activists would successfully expose the illegal spying operations of Hoover and how citizens across America were subject to the FBI's black ops, including Martin Luther King Jr. and actually Muhammad Ali as well. So that's an interesting little tidbit in the background that, again, your major news organizations aren't going to include in their sort of big real and and weepy memory pieces but again just as you said james we're kind of breaking a lot of these you know mystical mythical things online i actually told a personal story about the time i didn't meet muhammad ali back in the early 90s on the latest good news next week episode two it's called so much solar energy they're giving it away and that's what's happening in chile and we also talk a little bit about poo power and tofu power on an energy related good news next week episode James, we always implore people to hit us up with news ideas using hashtag New World Next Week and some of the big, supremely depressing headlines we are watching. FBI wants instant access to your search histories. China plans to become a GMO giant. And after secret Harvard meeting, scientists announced plans for synthetic human ge- genomes. And the Pfizer CEO can't distinguish between the policies of Trump and Hillary. And that's pretty much what we're looking at, James. So hopefully people will see through the distractions. And if independent, non-commercial alternative media means something and enriches them, hopefully they'll take that dollar away from corporate coffee and maybe throw it to a little bit of listener-supported media. James? That's it. We can't do it without you guys in every sense, whether it's collating the data, helping to spread the data, or helping to support the people who are sharing the data. Um, in, In every possible way, we need you and... It's all a collaborative effort. So my hat's off to everyone out there who is taking part. James, that's going to do it for this week. Talk to you next week. All right. Take care.